everyone. Welcome to Well and Spinning. My name is Rachel and um, I can be found pretty much everywhere as Well for Pearls. This is Saturday, um, February 27th, 2021. It is the last Saturday in February. We were actually talking about this morning, Mike and I, so we were saying that um, February, so Mike was like, February is only shorter by a couple of days. Like it's not that big a deal. But I was like, yeah, but it's the difference between another weekend. Um, and you know, three days, if it's a 31 day month versus February, which is 28 days, it's 10%. So we were sort of laughing a little bit because it always feels like um, a slightly, like February just goes like that, you know, January kind of drags and then February starts to get a bit brighter. We often get really nice weather here in February, cold, but um, lots of sun. So anyways, it's really good to see everybody. Thank you so much for being here. If you are a new viewer and you are just checking out the podcast for the first time, welcome. And if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to hit the like button and the subscribe button, I would really appreciate it. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for watching the show week in, week out. I really appreciate you being here and for your time spent here in this place. Now to our Patreon community, welcome. You guys are what keeps the lights on week after week after week, and I really appreciate it. Um, we have a lot going on in the community. As you guys know, we have a lot of alongs right now. If Patreon isn't something that interests you and you don't want to do Patreon, please come on over to the Ravelry group. Um, if you are on Ravelry and if you use Ravelry, um, because there is a lot going on and there's, um, a lot of chitter chatter in that Ravelry group and a lot of support. So if you're just starting on your spinning journey and you're looking for some spinning friends, uh, we would love to have you. As well, you can check out the hashtag wool and spinning, just like the podcast and um, no apostrophe because it's a hashtag, but wool and spinning on Instagram. And you'll find some fellow community members there as well, especially if you're not on um, Ravelry. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, I can see the chat is just tick tocking away. Um, I've got, let me see. Oh, Erica's going to be weaving during the, the stream. That's amazing. So I have to tell you, Erica, I was thinking about you the other day. So during one of our virtual spin groups on uh, when I was doing my silk sampler, when I was doing that stool, um, I actually took the laptop over to the Leclerc, to my jack loom, my big 45 floor loom. And I took a C-clamp because Mike has lots of different sized C-clamps. And I took a small one and I actually ratcheted it onto so that the laptop wouldn't fall. Um, I ratcheted it onto the top of the loom. So like if the laptop was sitting here, I put the C-clamp here and, um, and then uh, I could um, make sure then the laptop wouldn't fall. And I was able to like watch and be a part of the Zoom meeting since I'm host. <laughs> So that was really super cool. Um, I, uh, I That was a very clever thing um, because I'm always trying to like, with my phone, I'm, I bought this case so that I could like prop it up and do all sorts of fun things, but it doesn't really work. Um, I find as I, as I weave and as I beat mostly, um, the the phone kind of jiggles just a little bit and it kind of rattles around a little bit and it kind of falls down but the c-clamp with the laptop because i've got a small chromebook for the podcast for the work that we do here i was feeling pretty brilliant kind of you know dust off the shoulders a little bit so toot toot puff puff um everybody is here it's so good to see you guys so uh karen says we usually sleep through february it's so dull but now I have joined this site and I ended up doing more than usual. That's awesome, Karen. What a great um, thing. Cast on my very first sweater during this podcast. That's amazing, Debbie. And thank you, Debbie, for reaching out um, with those uh, um, locks earlier in the week. Spinning the last little bit of white breed and color study braid. That's what Bridget's doing. Uh, Susie says hi from Luxembourg. That's amazing. Uh, my parents have actually been to Luxembourg. Um, that is, oh, cool. Um, Erica, so she did a zoom class with her live streaming setup in November and she was caged in by cameras and her laptop. <laughs> you know, the C clamps worked really, really super well. So definitely give them a try, Erica. And I know with the type of loom that you have that you would be able to figure out, a um, something that would work. So, uh, we've got a happy birthday to wish to Sarah cause her birthday is on the 1st of March. So, uh, happy birthday, um, Sarah, cause it's just two days away. Um, I hope it's, I hope it's a good one. And 
What else has been happening here this week? It has been very busy. So I'm going to say this now at the beginning of the podcast so that uh, I don't forget to mention it at the end of the podcast because chances are I will forget because we always end up chit-chatting and an hour goes by like that and we forget what time it is. Next weekend, next Saturday, there will not be a live stream next Saturday. There will not be a podcast next Saturday. Um, I have a very, very busy week coming up. Uh, it kind of started yesterday and it will continue until basically a week Monday. So February, so March, like, what is that? March like 8th ish. I am filming quite an in-depth uh, quite a long, it's going to be quite labor intensive workshop at the school of sweet Georgia all week. And, um, they're going to be really super full days of filming. Uh, and I, I just, I think by Saturday, I'm going to need a breather. So we don't have queries and explorations next Saturday. And I thought that that was a good week to just take a break. I always take a Saturday off in March, um, because we have spring break. And so usually like we're trying to get the trailer out, we're going camping and all that kind of fun stuff. And, um, I normally take that that one sort of week off, if you will, that one weekend later in the month. But it, I talked to Mike about it for quite a long time last night, and um, it just feels right to take it next weekend instead of waiting until later in the month and just being absolutely burned out. So there will not be a live stream next Saturday. So that is March 6th, okay? So we're just going to take one week I always take a week off um, in March anyways, um, just to give myself a a bit of a, um, a chance to reset and rejuvenate, but we're gonna just gonna do it a little bit earlier than usual. That also means for, the, for those um, of you that are part of queries and explorations, that we're not gonna have any schedule changes later in the month. I had mentioned to you guys last time that there would be some schedule changes because of taking that week off, but now there won't be. We'll just stick with the schedule and I'll just take next Saturday off. Okay. So I hope that's okay. Um, thank you, Becca, for the congratulations on the class. It's been a huge amount of work. It's been amazing. Greta and I got, actually got to work together. Um, and we're going to be working together in the studio filming. So that'll be really fun. And, um, but it's just, uh, uh, it's going to be a very intense week. And actually, unfortunately, there's a lot of driving uh, because uh, I'm going to be going into Vancouver multiple times, which I love doing. I went into Vancouver on Wednesday to pick up the spring. And I, as I was driving, she, where I, where I got it from, um, the lady who was selling it, she actually lives a block from where we used to have our condo. So as I was driving out to UBC, because she lives right on that UBC border in Vancouver, for those of you who know, um, Vancouver. Uh, I was driving out there. I was like, Oh, I really miss it out here. <laughs> and then I was driving, ho driving back out and driving home. And I was like, I really like where we live now too. <laughs> I know, I know you guys are so funny. How dare I take time off? Um, a Saturday off. What will you guys do? You know what I was thinking? You guys should get together and have a little zoom hour together. Somebody could host it and you guys could do that. Um, Oh, Loreline, that's hilarious. No stream on her birthday. So you've got a birthday coming up. There are a ton of birthdays coming up in March. Um, so uh, yeah, you guys, um, um, we need to do some uh, happy birthday -ing. Yeah, it's going to be a long drive. I can't imagine how bad traffic has gotten since I moved away. You know what? It's so funny, Kelly. And then we'll get into the show. Um, so because of where we live, uh, we're right on the highway. We are literally a minute and a half from one of the freeway entrances. I can actually get from our house to my wa on Granville Island in 35 minutes. So if there's no traffic and that was where our vet used to be. So when we still had our dogs. So, um, cause my, it, our vet was a friend of mine and I felt very strongly about continuing to take them there cause I wanted to still see Anna. And it was 35 minutes with no traffic. And you know, it's so funny on Wednesday when I was going in to get the loom, there were seven accidents and it took me about an hour and, um, hour and whatever it was. And, uh, oh, Eve, you're right. We need to talk about that. Anyways, um, the, uh, um, the, 
yeah, so there were seven accidents going in and I was like, what is going on? Like what the truck? So um, it was kind of one of those funny days when you when you have to go in. Uh, where the Sweet Georgia studio is, I actually will be taking a different route to get there. I don't have to take Highway 1. So it'll be, a, it's a little bit different. So it's a little bit different of a drive. It's more, it is, but it is a full hour. So uh, to get there, just because it's not distance that's the issue. Uh, it's um, it, like, it's all of the, the bridges and the tunnels and the, the workarounds. So like in Toronto, for example, you're driving on the 401 for a really super long time. In Vancouver, you're navigating bridges and tunnels and that's, and traffic and that's what, and it gets really bottlenecked every time you have a bridge or a tunnel. So that's what makes it congested, but you're not driving as far in terms of distance. Does that make sense? So, uh, queries and explorations, you're right. It's probably on the first and third Saturday. So I'll put something in the Slack channel. Um, we'll, we'll figure it out, but, uh, this coming Saturday, I will, I will take it off. It's funny, actually, you guys are talking about birthdays for, uh, March. So my best friend's birthday is on March 13th. My brother's birthday is on March 10th. My dad's birthday is on St. Patrick's day on March 17th. Nora's birthday is on the 29th of March and Mike's Nana. So the kid's great Nana and their uncle is on March 14th. <laughs> Everybody is in March. Everybody in our family is a Pisces. So, um, yes, Diana, there were some problems with the link this morning, the direct YouTube link. I had accidentally put in the link for last week, so I'm really sorry, you guys. I did update it. You just need to refresh the uh, thing. But if you're in the chat already, then you have figured it out. So, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. That was my oversight yesterday. Uh, maybe we need to have, like, a birthday, uh, um, a birthday thing in March. Um, oh, that's awesome, Susie. So she's currently watching the School of Sweet Georgia classes spinning for socks and spinning for the sweater. That's amazing. Thank you. And actually, Diana's uh, spindle spinning uh, classes on there are awesome. And uh, Katrina has a whole bunch of classes on there as well. So definitely look them up as well. And Debbie Held has a, an e-spinner course on there now and a supported spindle course, which is something that Diana's been looking at um, and working on really um, diligently through the pandemic. I'm, I'm a little bit, um, envious cause I, I feel like this was such a perfect time to work on support spindling. And there was, uh, I, I think I just commend, commend you, Diana, for spending that time on your support spindles. I know you love your spindles so much. Um, you have passed some of that love on to me. So in today's show, I have only a very small amount of spinning to share with you. I thought that I would share with you my, um, the, uh, fin, yeah, sorry, Sherry, about the link. Um, uh, from Long Way Homestead, I thought we would just sit on the wheel for a couple minutes and I would share with you how this is going because it's a very interesting spin, this fin. Um, it's uh, a very, what I would call sort of, it's going to spin up to be quite a rustic yarn. So we'll talk about that. And um, I wanted some feedback from the community based on something that um eve had suggested yesterday to me we had a big conversation about it and i wanted to get your guys feedback i also need some feedback from you guys about some uh, opportunities that our community has with sanjo silk here in vancouver kind of like the spinning boxes with silk that we did uh, in January and February, um, I would love to, um, have, um, some feedback from you guys. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we've got lots of community participation from last week that we didn't get to. And I wanted to spend time on that today. So we'll, we'll finish off with that. And I've got my shifty in the background here to share with you. So we kind of got like a bit of a smattering of lots of different things today. P you guys have been making such a huge amount um, over the last week or so. And there are some gorgeous photos in the Slack channel and on the Ravelry group um, that I'm really hoping um, to kind of save up. And we'll do a big community participation, um, not next weekend, but the weekend after. So without further ado, let's get into the show. And then we'll start off with talking about the Sanjo Silk stuff because I need your feedback. So I'm sort of putting a call out to the community. So with that cliffhanger, <laughs> we'll get into it.
So um, I wanted to mention, if you're having trouble with the links in the morning when you're having trouble accessing the uh, podcast and the live stream, um, the uh, be sure when you're sitting there like at like 25 after 8, whatever your time zone is, just hit refresh because chances are there's a link that was wrong or was isn't working or there's a problem and somebody's let me know on the Slack channel or I've checked it because I do check them. Um, so just, uh, refresh the post, um, and keep refreshing it. If you click on that link and it still doesn't work, refresh the post again. Um, you can always right click on the, when it's where it says direct YouTube link here and the here is underlined and that's the link, right click and say, open a new tab. And then if it doesn't work, you can refresh the page, um, and close the other tab. Does that make sense? So just some tips and tricks there. Um, I don't know about the camera, Kelly. I'm okay on this, on this end. Are you guys, um, the OBS seems to be fine. Um, you maybe refresh, maybe it's your internet connection. I'm not sure. That's, um, and, and it might be YouTube. You never know. So, um, Sanjo Silk, they reached out to me again because you guys were, um, so excited about the spinning box. They were wondering, um, if you guys would be interested in, um, another spinning box. The opportunity is to maybe do something a little bit bigger. So it'd be more like a 36 ounce, uh, deli container. So there would be six, uh, samples in there instead of just four. And the, um, because we're looking at luxury fibers for the whole year, um, and because we're sort of going through other, we're going to be starting the camelids in the summer. So we're going to be looking at alpaca and llama, yak, uh, yak, camel. I said llama. Um, we're going to be looking at kiviet in April. Um, so what I was, um, one, so what they were wondering was, would you guys be interested in building on your silk study that you're doing now? Um, and looking at some of these fibers in combination. So like yak silk, um, and some of the, um, sort of, uh, silks that are meant for blending, um, some of the llama alpaca silk, or sorry, alpaca silks, um, llama silk, some of, some of that, those sort of weird and wonderful blends. And whether or not you would want to look at some of these fibers dyed, um, because they do spin differently once they've been dyed. And of course you can get amazing color. So I would really like to hear from you guys <laughs> Zan, all the boxes. Um, I would like to hear from you guys. Um, what, what you would, if there were six things in a box, um, what would you, so they would be different. They would, the boxes wouldn't include this, the silks that you've already spun. What would you guys want in them? So would, would you want like, you know, blends? Um, and would you want a couple of them dyed? So Diana's idea was, um, to do boxes that would coordinate so that all of the fibers in the box would be, um, coordinating. So there would be some natural shades and some dyed and, but it would all go together and you could use it in one big project. Um, her background is weaving. And so when I was talking to her, um, we were talking about the idea of sort of these, these yarns, um, in relation to sort of how you could use them in, in a woven fabric, but you could absolutely knit with them too. Anything you can weave, spin to weave with, you can spin to knit with. Um, we were thinking about all the blends and dyed. <laughs> um, we were kind of thinking about, um, I know Dorothy, you just said no dyed silk top. So we were thinking more along the lines of like, some of the other stuff that's out there. And there is some absolutely beautifully dyed silk out there to spin, like beautiful. So, but unfortunately, I think many of us have had not great experiences with dyed silk top that doesn't have all the Saracen or the majority of the Saracen removed. And so then you get this like crunchy, hard kind of top. That's not the kind of stuff that we're talking about here. So, um, yeah, the idea of coordinating was so that we could sort of work through the boxes or you guys could work through the boxes, um, and have a group of yarns that you've sampled and you've learned from and you've spun different ways, but then you can also take it one step further into an actual project. So please keep the feedback coming. 
jot any of your ideas in the Slack channel, throw them into the comment section here on YouTube. You do not need to be a patron to participate. They do offer a little bit of a discount to patrons, but um, if you're not a patron, but you participate in this community and you watch and you're interested, please throw your comments in and your thoughts, especially if you did participate um, in the Sanjo box that was uh, offered um, in January and February. So um, please uh, um, uh, let us know your, let me know your thoughts and then I can pass it back on to uh, Diana because that's really, really, really helpful. Um, yeah. So yeah, the peduncle tassar, um, Diana is amazing. So the, the, uh, unfortunately the, um, the tassar, the, the next batch that they got was a little bit different from what Yumi and Kim had. So that was kind of too bad, but it's still just amazing stuff and really, really fun to spin. I know everybody in the community who had, who had ordered some independently all really enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, we, the link, um, when you have trouble joining, um, Billy, the, the um, we hit refresh. We, we talked about it earlier in the stream. Um, the link wasn't working. So I'm really sorry about that. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention was something that Eve had suggested. Um, so we're doing a little bit of sort of housekeeping today, which I don't like to spend lots of time on the podcast about, but it's important stuff. This was my three ply fractal uh, spin for the breed and color study that we're going to be talking about in May and June. As I share with you what I did with my breed and color study, why I did it, things that I would think about in the future, all those things that we get in spinning pearls and the thoughtful spinner and how I spin. Eve had the idea and was hoping for, so I, this is where I really want to see, hear from you guys. Um, the, uh, Naomi, it's the, uh, Saracen. It, uh, isn't, um, it's the, the Saracen, um, and then they dye it over top and it makes it crunchy. Um, in relation to the breed and color study, Eve and I were talking about, um, this whole, um, idea that many, many of us are sort of either want to be or are garment knitters. And part of the problem is when you've got a big hank of hand spun like this and you want to use it in a sweater pattern the gauge and the fabric and the needle size and the fitting and the row gauge and just kind of all the things doesn't necessarily translate from a commercial pattern into your hand spun. And so she was wondering and asking about what we thought about sort of looking at some of that around um, uh, adjusting a garment and um, looking at it from the perspective of this is the garment, this is the template of the pattern. Now I want to take my hand spun and I want to plug it into the pattern. And how do I go about doing that when my row gauge is different, my stitch gauge is different, my fabric is slightly different. And, um, I, and I'm just kind of a little bit overwhelmed with the number of decisions that I need to make because now I have to make adjustments to the to the length of the yoke. Um, I need to make adjustments to the sleeves. How do I do those stitches? Is that something that you guys need help with where you would like it sort of a little bit more laid out versus just talking about it on the podcast? Because if so, um, that is something that I can do, <laughs> but I want to hear from you guys and hear what, what, what is it that you're looking for? So if we were to look at, taking a commercial, taking a pattern and commercial yarn and plugging it into and, and taking, and taking our hand spun and plugging it into that pattern. It's kind of almost like it's yarn substitution, but it's a little bit different. It's kind of like what we did last year, but this is a little bit, I would actually take you through my process rather than creating, um, something that's a little bit more theoretical. So, um, I would love, that's right, Dorothy, that's how you spell it. Um, I would love to hear from you guys, not just that you would like that, but what is it that you're struggling with specifically? Is it gauge? Is it row gauge? Um, is it um, stitch counts? Um, is it short rows? Um, yeah, that would be great. Tell me. <laughs> Give me all your things. That would be great. So... Um, if it were spe of specific on hand spun rather than, yeah, so this is, uh, absolutely Julia. So this is like specifically for hand spun. So the idea is to actually cr like take you through exactly what I do, 
um, when I'm sub subbing um, hand spun for commercial because you guys know that I play around with patterns a lot. So that actually, let's segue that into the shifty, okay? I feel like you guys are really super chatty this morning. I The chat just keeps on going and going and going, which I think is just absolutely wonderful. So thank you. Adjusting raglans. I can't wrap around my, my head around it some, for some reason. Kelly, that's super helpful. Um, lots of math on something I do not understand. Debbie, absolutely. You know how, that's how I felt when I first started adjusting patterns. I was like, well, I guess this is kind of how you do it. And I'll just kind of see. So I ended up ripping out a lot of sweaters. Um, I think how it alters the fabric would be great to know. That's really, really um, a good, that actually, Sarah, that, yeah, that's a really important one. Um, and I think sometimes we kind of get overwhelmed with the thought that we have to do all these things. And then, um, and then we sort of end up, you know, paralyzed with all the decisions that we think we have to make. And sometimes you just kind of have to cast on. So you say that like chat isn't always, you know what? It's funny, Zan, because when I'm talking a lot about something really specific, so when we're like hyper-focused on something or I'm sitting at the wheel like we will in a minute and I'm actually spinning, you guys get really quiet mm -hmm. <laughs> and the chat kind of stops. But when I'm asking you questions and asking for feedback, then the chat's like super fast and I have it slowed down so that I can keep up because otherwise I, I can't keep up with you guys. Um, so I will go back and look at the chat with all of your suggestions um, after the show, um, probably in a couple of weeks, and have a look at what you guys um, what you guys said because it, it it can be a lot of math actually, Naomi. That's a really good um, it it can be and it can be really overwhelming, but we can also simplify it. So this is my shifty. This is a pattern by Andrea Maori. It is very popular. Many people on Ravelry have knit it. Lots of people on Instagram have knit it. If you search the hashtag shifty pullover, um, it will come up. And um, mine is being done out of West Coast color and um, out of Lynn's Falkland. So there was a photo in the um, um, intro credits of the colors and the yarn that I'm of the color of the yarn that I'm using. They were stacked up. Um, but this is Polworth and Silk. This is the background. So I said they were all Falkland, but they're actually not. This is Polworth and Silk. Um, I'll put this in front of my face so that it will, will um, uh, focus. Um, I have a ton of this yarn. So I actually have of this little ball, I have another um, one, two, three. I have another four of these that are quite substantial. I didn't realize I had quite so much of this yarn spun. I'm not sure I would have used this if I knew how much yarn I had. I think I maybe would have done something a little bit more that used a bit more yarn. But regardless, um, I am happy with the progress thus far. I have started wearing a lot of green in the last year. I don't really know why because I really went off green when I was in university because everybody always wanted to put me in green because I have green eyes. And um, I really, I got really sick of it. And I really, for the last um, almost, almost, yeah, over 15 years, almost 20 years, I really haven't worn a lot of green. But I bought this green tank top for in the summer back last summer and I have a couple of t-shirts that are green now and it's been kind of nice um reintroducing green into my um wardrobe so I got the remember how I had shown you guys that I had spun the Falkland and I thought I was done and then I found the other half of the braid <laughs> yeah so this is the other half I've got it all spun up um, it's a two ply. It spun up in one afternoon. It was so super stinking fast. This was gold. This is the gold Falkland that was in the uh, yoke. This was the background color that I used for my Copenhagen cardigan that I knit right at the um, right at late 2019, early 2021. Sorry, late 2019, early 2020. Um, and I held this with mo uh, mohair a mohair silk yarn for that sweater. And then this is the blue at the bottom, which has kind of ended up being a bit bright, as you can see on the dress form. And because my row gauge was quite different, so talking about sweater modification, um, the I thought that I would have equal sections of each color, but that would have taken the blue all the way down. I think the sweater would have ended up being like 20 inches long or something, which is too long. 
So what I did was I only did half of the blue. Um, so it works out to be about half of what the, what the pink would have been. And I added at the back. So if you notice as, as I pull my dress form around, um, if you notice there's kind of like this dip here, I added short rows at the back. So it actually comes down because that was something I loved about the love note when I, before I ripped it out, I loved that the back came down a bit. And some of the unit Toronto uh, patterns, they do the same thing. Um, the Cathedral does that and one of her other ones uh, does that. And I just really like the that extra fabric down here at the back. So I added, um, I think I added four short rows. I think it, I think it worked out to four or six. I can't remember. I wrote it down somewhere. Um, six, I think it was six short rows down here. Um, so that it just brought it down just that little bit. And then I added my, um, inch and a half of ribbing at the bottom and I didn't downsize my needles. Um, because I wanted it to be quite stretchy and I wanted it to have lots of space so it could go over high waisted jeans quite nicely. And now I'm onto the sleeves. So I'm in the pink here. I made a big mistake uh, at tutoring the other night because um, I was helping Nora with her reading while I was knitting and I messed up the blips. That's what she calls them in the pattern. I messed up the blips in here and I had to rip all this back and start again. So um, I ended up skipping one of the, like I think it was like the third row. So um, that's the only thing. So overall, I'm, I, I'm pretty happy with it. The blue is quite bright. Um, so it kind of, I feel like it kind of draws your eye downward, which is sort of not really what I wanted. But I think once you've got like, I think once you've got it on and once, once it's sort of in place, um, I will be, um, it'll be okay. I'll be, I'll be happy with it. So, um, it's been a great learning experience. It's very warm. I had it on the other day and I was surprised, like just to try it on, I was surprised how warm it was like, cause it's basically double layer, like it's mosaic knitting. So you're slipping stitches, um, two out of four rows. And so because of that, you're carrying all of this color. And when you see it in real life, cause on the, I think unfortunately on the podcast, it kind of looks a bit muddy. Um, but when you see it up close, it's actually, um, it's actually really pretty. Uh, it's just that the blue is really bright. So, um, yeah, in some ways I kind of am tempted to go back and rip that out and put, put the, the gold back in, but then you'd end up with this stripe of pink across. So I'm not sure I might just leave it depending on how much pink is left over and what I do with the sleeves. Um, I think the sleeves will kind of tie it all together. And when you look at it on Andrea, her sample, she has quite distinct striping in hers as well. And then once it's on and she's wearing it, it's really quite lovely. Um, and hers ended here because hers was a cropped version. So this would have been ribbing here. And I added mine. Mine is a total of, I think at the bottom, at the back, it, it under for, from the underarms to here, I think it works out to 16 and a half inches. And the front is about 15 and a half inches. So I'm going to have to close that blind. It has been so cloudy. That I thought we would be lucky, but no, <laughs> thank you you guys for being so, so patient with me. Um, let me just catch up on chat really quickly. You guys, um, let me just have a look. Short rows at the back is a great idea. It was a it was um an easy modification to make too, um because it um just kind of you know you've got the short rows at the back neck and then if you have those that added fabric at the back, I just feel like when you um sit down, it just gives you that little bit of extra fabric at the back. And I usually wear high waisted jeans, so my jeans come up to here, but um because I just prefer them. But um because my um, my waist just because of my hips and my waist, it means I don't have that gap at the back of my jeans. But um, it's still nice to feel covered, especially when you're, because um, I'm thinking sort of in the future, um, you know, teaching and and um, sort of, you know, when we, when we start to travel a little bit again, um, it's just nice to be able to um, have some of these garments where you're wearing them and you're going to be in them all day. Um, and you're going to be wearing them because like, you know, I know Diana, um, you've said like at Fibers West, like if you're teaching all day um, in the um, in the barn where where it's held, um, it's 
it's cold, you know? So if you're, and if you're teaching and moving around all day and stuff, you want to be wearing something that you're not constantly pulling at. Or like if I'm outside in the cul-de-sac with the kids and we're moving around, I don't want to be pulling at my garments. So that was something that I really regretted about my Copenhagen. Um, I didn't put buttons on it because it called for afterthought buttons. And I still to this day wish I had put but buttonholes in um, properly um, because I've never added the buttons to it. And I think that was, that was something. That's why I don't wear it very often because I want to be able to like button it up once in a while all the time. Um, I saw Andrea's at Knit City a few years ago. Um, she was wearing it and she, um, the next day I saw her in one of her other ones that has the boat neck. What's that one called? Um, cause it, seeing it in the pattern, it was never something that I would want to knit, but then seeing it in person, um, it was something that I was like, Oh, that's something I would maybe think about making. Um, so I saw her in, let me just have a look. It was, so she was wearing her shifty the one day and then the other day she was wearing her, where is it? The heartstrings crop. So that's this one. I'll throw it in the chat for you guys. Um, she was wearing her heartstrings because I didn't like the neck on that one, but then seeing it in real per in real life on her at the show, I was like, oh. So that was when I saw her. I think so, I think so, Holly. I think the, the sleeves will kind of tie it all together because the sleeves, the blue will be a bit longer because my sleeves will be longer because my arms are so long. So um, yeah, the back draft, I like that. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, uh, a good, a good way of putting it. Um, Oh, that's not a bad idea, Wendy, adding clasps instead of buttons. And then they could be invisible and I don't need buttonholes. I could just put clasps on. That's not a bad idea, Wendy. I also have a really pretty shawl pin that um, is wooden that actually probably could work quite well if I got a bit creative. I never use shawl pins. I wore a shawl pin once and I stabbed myself so badly that I've never really worn one ever since. So I think I just, it was from moving around. Um, all right, let's get spinning. So let's move the camera around. I will show you this roving first. So this is Longway Homestead. This is part of her Breed of the Month program. So Longway Homestead is located in Alberta, in Alberta, in Manitoba. Um, she is, um, a fiber mill, a farm, a small batch yarn mill as well. They can do yarn as well. Um, if you want to learn more about Anna, you can go to longwayhomestead.com. And um, when you sign up to the Fiber Club, you um, basically sign up for only 12 months. So you kind of commit to the 12 months unless you cancel your um, subscription before then. And um, you uh, sort of, you get 12 months of, of natural colored pin drafted roving um, over the course of the 12 months. And we have kind of learned as a community that depending on when you signed up, you get different stuff, but in the end, everybody kind of ends up with the same stuff. It's just what order you get it in is maybe a little bit different. So my Icelandic actually came yesterday. So I'm actually really excited about this one because, um, the, the, the pin drafted roving, so it comes flat packed. So it comes via, letter mail which is brilliant because it keeps shipping down and uh so the the breed so the breed of the month like for if you're american um it's really really affordable i would even say it's cheap um and then for the canadians um because our shipping is so expensive um it makes it a really accessible and affordable for for pretty much everyone i think for me so Canadian, I think it's only like $22 a month or something. And that includes shipping or 24. It's under $25. Um, it's a couple of lattes. Um, so this is the Icelandic. So I, I, the one thing, if you do join the club, be sure to open up your package and um, undo the vacuum pack right away so that the uh, roving can start to come back to life. Um, because being flat packed like that and being vacuumed like that, it, it will damage it over time or it'll just take a longer time for it to come back to life if you want to spin it. So this is the Icelandic. So this is really, really nice and clean. It's, it's going to draft just really, really beautifully. I am actually planning on spinning this on my spindles. I am going to save this. Well, I don't know how long I'll save it for because I'm trying to spin through things. Um, but I am planning on doing it on my spindles. Um, I love Icelandic as soft spun 
uh, two ply. So we'll kind of make like a low P yarn. Um, so that is my plan. It'll be very similar to my Gotland that I talked about last week. Um, I find I use those yarns when I do that. The name of the club is Long Way Homestead. Thanks, Diana. Um, it is a mix of the Tog and the Thel. It's all of it. So, um, yeah. The So this is the last little bit of my fin. So my the fin was sent out to me because everybody gets it on different dates. Um, it was sent out to me. I think I got this one in J January. I think it was the third one that I got. I'm trying to find the end. And um, it's pin drafted roving. There's still some VM in it. You can see there's still some, some VM. Uh, as I've been spinning, a lot of that has fallen out. Um, and there are some naps and, and some um, uh, uh, coarser bits. But um, And there are some short bits in here. And I've just been pulling them out. This is a mixed fin. So there's some white in here. There's some dark brown. There's some gray. Um, and so what I've been doing, I played around with it quite a lot when I first started playing with this. Oh, that's so funny, Diana. So her Icelandic is brownish and mine is completely and totally gray. Like, look at it. it. It's, it's the same gray as the fin. Like if to the un, to the untrained eye, non spinner, they would think that these are the same. Um, isn't that funny? And my, um, it is Canadian fiber. Um, um, yeah, it is, uh, Tiffany. So I've been spinning this on my minstrel, this wheel, I was spinning on it this morning. Um, yesterday during book club, we had a great session. Um, it was really chattery. Um, uh, my, my minstrel, I just, no matter what I did, I could not get it to stop ch chitter chattering. So hopefully, um, you guys, hopefully it won't be too chitter chattery today while I'm spinning. Um, but basically what I did was I set it up in double drive. So let me pull this forward so that you can see that. And I put it on the fastest ratio that I have access to on the minstrel, which I think is about 18 to one. And uh, I put the bobbin on so that the small whirl was at the back because you want the smaller, uh, bobbin, um, the smaller end of your bobbin to go with your faster ratios. And then if you're using your bigger ratios, which is this guy here that's stored on the front of the wheel, this big guy here, then you turn the bobbin around, you can use this one. So if you're having trouble tensioning and double drive, just turn your bobbin around so that there's, um, so that you're using the bigger side. Um, so I've got dust on the wheel from this, um, from this roving. It's, um, why won't you go back on? Well, I'll do it after. So yeah, so like I said, it was really chitter chattery yesterday, but this morning it was actually pretty good and it wasn't, it wasn't chitter chattering too much. So hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, cause it does create a lot of feedback on the camera and, um, I oiled it really well at the end of, um, book club yesterday and left it to sit overnight. So I think that that was, uh, uh, part of, you know, just helped a little bit. The wheel is still new. So it just, it, it hasn't, it's still chatty, chattery. And the Kromsky wheels tend to be a bit chattery anyways, but, um, just cause you've got wood on metal. So you're going to have more chitter chatter, but, uh, it still needs to be oiled and just takes time to break in a wheel, right? It's like a car. It just takes time. So the reason why I ended up spinning this long draw, Dana had a great question. Um, she had a great question. How do you decide how to spin um, each of the fibers? It's just sampling at the wheel and just giving giving yourself that time to play and to figure out um, what you like, what works well, um, what characteristics of the underlying fiber that you want to um, um, highlight. So if you want a really super, if you've got a long wool, um, you know, that's got lots of sheen and, uh, it's really coarse and the fiber diameter is quite high. Um, so the micron count is quite high. So you know that you're not gonna be able to wear it next to your skin, but it's got this gorgeous sheen and it's going to be really super hard wearing, you know, you might spin it so that it's a little bit more firmly spun. Um, and it's a little bit more ropey, um, because you're going to weave it into a rug. 
and you need that that firm spun um, uh, fiber um, to be able to handle the pressure and the tension on your floor loom um, and the heavy heavy hard beat uh, and then the wear and tear of being a doormat um, you know so you sort of highlighting those characteristics of that really hard wearing wool versus say a Rambouillet, um, which was my first um, fiber that I got from Longway Homestead. Um, and it was this pin drafted, you know, really super short stapled, uh, really airy prep. And so I spun it long draw um, with not a huge amount of twist. Um, it was really light and airy and sproingy. Um, you know, it plied up at a lace weight and bounced up to a heavy fingering. And um, I applied it firmly because it can handle that twist and it can take that that extra twist. And um, that is going to create just an awesome next to the skin, bouncy, sproingy, airy yarn. Um, so it really depends on what you what what the underlying characteristics are of the fiber, what you're trying to highlight. With this, the I because of these kind of snags almost, they're kind of like these areas of the roving and of the fiber that of the of the pin drafted roving that just kind of the fibers kind of seem to kind of get a bit stuck um and there's usually some vm in those areas the neps some noils i've had to go back and double draft quite a bit i've just been trying to keep my treadling feet really super consistent so that i end up with about four treadles when i get out to about 15 18 inches from the orifice of the wheel and um going back and double drafting, pulling out VM when I need to, and then winding on. So it's roughly four treadles, which is four times my right foot when I get to about here and then wind on. And that's kind of what has been working really well. It seems to create a really nice singles because when I do a plyback test and actually we'll do this properly and we'll go off the bobbin. So I use my orifice hook for this and I'm just going to hang it down and let the orifice hook take. So see how it's not going really super quickly. So there's not tons and tons of twist in this. Um, the plyback test is not going to be really super firm. See how light and airy that is. I can zoom in for you guys. It's really light and airy. Um, it's not, not really super, um, this is not strong yarn. This is a real woolen yarn. If you were to pull on it with any strength, you'd break it. However, if that's for my singles, if I gave this an extra couple of twists, wish I'd left my orifice hook in, that'd be easier. If I gave this a couple extra twists, now I've got this really bouncy, Sproingy elastic yarn with really good memory, um, a little bit more firmly plied, but it's still going to be really airy and um, uh, next to the skin soft because I've just put that little bit more ply twist in it. I maybe wouldn't put that much in, but probably about there. Not lovely. And then you've got that that nice kickback. That's a nice a nice ply a, a, a nice a nice thing to look for when you're plying is that that nice um, snap. So you've got these light, airy, woolen, spun singles, and then um, I'll probably, and then I'll apply this a little bit more firmly, and it'll create a really, really lovely woolen yarn. And I just broke my singles by accident. See, not strong. So I'll fix this later, but that gives you an idea of sort of um, how I've been approaching these breed studies each month. Um, the last one was Corey Dale, and there was another one, and then I'll catch up with chat and answer any questions that there are. Um, the other one, there was Corey Dale, which I'm actually really looking forward to spinning. I know some were a bit disappointed about the Corey Dale, but I actually felt really excited about it because it's just a different way of prepping it. And um, I'm actually quite excited to play with that prep and to kind of see what what it's capable of next to um, some of the other Corydale that we're used to spinning, which is usually comb top. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to spin it from like a pin drafted roving. Now this is my other bobbin of fin. I've already finished this. So this is more than half of the four ounces um, that I've already spun this way. And then I have just this little bit left. So I won't get done this week because of what's going on. But it's something that I've been playing with in the background and really enjoying. So if you pull the yarn from the bobbin back through the orifice, does it lose twist? No, not, not enough to be... Um, but I just really like to take it off the bobbin because I know then it's like a really accurate plyback test. So yeah, Dana, if you like light and airy yarn, long draw is your next, your next thing to try. So get some, get some really good quality pin drafted roving and then just play. Um, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun, Debbie. She just bought a Corydale fleece. She washed it in the lock form and she's going to hand flick the locks. Oh, that sounds amazing. Amazing. What is the difference between more twist in the single and less in the ply and less twist in the single and more in the ply? So, uh, Barbel, that, that's something that, um, we've, we've actually talked a lot about in the community, actually, um, do some sampling and actually make those yarns. So when you spin, um, a single that has, that's higher twist and then you ply it low, low twist and then make a singles that has less twist and then ply it sig significantly harder. Those make two very different yarns. Um, the low twist single, high twist ply makes an amazing sweater yarn. The high twist single, low twist ply makes a really lovely lace yarn, like for lace knitting. Do those two samples, make those two yarns. Um, make all four, do the whole exercise. Uh, low twist single, low twist ply, low twist single, high twist ply, high twist single, low twist ply, high twist single, high twist ply, and look at your four yarns and analyze them. They are four totally different yarns. They are for four totally different uses. I really would highly recommend that you go through that exercise. We did it. Um, we've done it multiple times in our community and it's a really, really excellent um, experiment to go through. Um, and then in the middle, make a medium twist yarn, me like medium twist single, the words, Rachel. Uh, and then in the middle, the fifth one, make a medium twist single, medium twist ply and compare those five yarns. All right, let's do community participation um, because we have a lot from last week and we just didn't get to it last week. So uh, first of all, um, for February, um, we were working through um, your garment fitting issues. So February doesn't end technically until tomorrow. So if you want to throw a comment on YouTube or um, a into the um, uh, Ravelry uh, group, into the episode thread for February, um, I will be sending out one of the try it on tubing packages and just tell us about your garment fitting issues, which goes perfectly into the question that I had for you guys earlier about plugging hand spun into a pattern and working through my process start to finish. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And I had already, and then for March, we'll do something um, fresh. And actually the giveaway for March will be right up Kelly's alley. So um uh, we'll, we'll, uh, look forward to that because Kelly's going to swoon. So for community participation, we've been, there's been, uh, just the, the community has been absolutely humming with, um, uh, breeding color study. It's been just amazing. So sorry, I just want to turn this off because it's like right here next to me. It's the cameras kind of, um, they bug me when they're on and not used being used. Breeding color study is running until the end of June and we're looking at Shetland and we've been looking at black natural color, natural shades of, of, uh, Shetland. Um, so black natural shades, orange, navy blue peaches, and sort of the border colors that you get when those colors kind of shift across comb top. So Shauna, um, did some of her own dyeing. And um, I'm just going to read what she wrote. So these, she's finished three out of her nine braids of Shetland that she got for her braiding color study. So some of us are working from Katrina's stuff that she created for the community and the pre-orders. She's dyeing them right now. They will be shipped. Um, just give her um, some time to, to get that dyeing done and to get them out. Um, um, we were, she was, um, she let us know 
um, when we were doing the pre-orders that there would be a delay um, because she needed to get it from her supplier, get it dyed, and then get it shipped out. So please just be patient. Um, so Shauna is working on spinning the last of her braids now. Um, and these are the first three yarns that she had created. So um, this is the first time she's ever spun multiple braids to attempt for consistency, which is amazing. Well done so far, Shauna. Um, she made a sample card or control card, and it seems to be helping as she can check often to make sure that she's in the right zone for consistency. Each one is more thick and thin than she would like, but she's spinning much thicker than she normally does. And I find that is the case when I spin thicker. I feel like my singles are more inconsistent. And then when I go to ply and wash and finish, I'm like, oh, what was I worried about? So it's just funny how that happens. Uh, these are coming out as a two ply sports between sport and DK. And she's hoping to knit them up uh, to sport gauge for uh, stripes for the stripes pullover by uh, Andrea Maori. That'll be really neat too, because you'll see the different sections of the different stripes, but overall it will coordinate. So I think that is a really great um, idea. I think I can see even just in these initial three how that's going to work together really, really super well. Um, Becca just got her breed and color study. No idea what she wants to do. I know sometimes I feel like I have like, like decision paralysis. There's too many options. And I used to feel like I had to use all of the yarns together in one project, but I'm kind of over that now because it's just not realistic. When you've got three 100 gram braids, um, there isn't necessarily, that's not necessarily the way that you want to use it. You maybe want to use it multiple projects or multiple things, um, spin it in different ways. So I'm kind of getting, getting over that. <laughs> um, so the next project share was from Liz. I thought this was so cool. So I wanted to share this with you. So Liz is the owner and operator of Kingdom Fleece and Fiber Works, which you guys have heard us talk about on the podcast before. It's a mill in Vermont. Um, she got her breed and color study and she went straight to the pin drafter. Um, so the first two went through once and then the third one went through twice. Um, so you can see that putting these braids through the pin drafter, what that does which just makes me want a pin drafter. So if anybody could just like ship me one and just give me one, that would be amazing. <laughs> I just think it is so cool what you can do with a pin drafter. I think it's really, really cool. I'm almost tempted to, my last three little bundles that I have, I'm tempted to send them to Liz and be like, can you put them through the pin drafter for me? Um, I think it's so cool. It's such a neat way of doing it. And it'll just create such a light, airy prep with such beautiful color blending. So really, really, really cool. Thank you for sharing, Liz. Um, this is from Martha, who's in the chat today. She's been working through hers. This is the end of the spinning segment of part one of her Shetland study. She found that she's pretty terrible. Um, she, she found that she's really pretty terrible in pulling off equal amount, at, at pulling off equal amounts of fiber as the skeins are very different in yardage. Um, but she's also, but she also surprised herself and found that she likes the white skein the most. I think they're all beautiful. I love that one in the middle, the biggest one of the four, um, that's got those browns in it with the hits of pink. I think that one is just gorgeous. And the one at the very, very end, I think is beautiful. Um, but she likes the white skein because it feels bright and cheerful, but the rich tones in the murat and the gray are awesome. And she finds the colors that she chose, um, to work best for her are the white. The mix three ply has grown on her a lot too. Um, they're all somewhere between 13 and 15 wraps per inch, which is about a fingering sport. You're right, uh, Martha. And they all have different, slightly different weights, but that one at the very end, that three ply, that is just, that's gonna knit up really beautifully. Um, that one would work beautifully as the blips in a shifty toque that you would be surprised that would just knit up absolutely amazingly in that. Yeah. Yeah. Sending it through a Diz would have the same effect. Absolutely. Eve. Um, and you could actually strip your, your, I'm actually, I'm thinking out loud. You could strip your braid down so that you had slightly thinner, um, bits of fiber and then you could pull them through the Diz that way. That would work really, really well. So yeah, it makes me want a pin drafter. <laughs> If somebody, if somebody could just donate one to me. So we also have some 51 yarns. We haven't done, um, group A is finished. Uh, so now we're on to group B with their 51 yarns. And Allison did a 
whole bunch of spinning, which is amazing. So this is long wool tail spinning, uh, fiber processed by yourself and double coated, which is amazing. So she had eight ounces of raw teas water that she had received um, fi from Fiber Curio. And um, she's been participating in the SC2 SC project sponsored by the live the Shave 'em to Save 'em, um, sponsored by um, the Livestock Conservancy. And um, the Tees Water was listed as critical on the endangered sheep list, which of course many of us have talked about. And uh, what I loved about this was that um, uh, she she did quite a few different things with her spin. So uh, it's unusual to see Tees Water that's not only white which um, is really that that gorgeous um, gray brown is just beautiful. So there's a huge, um, she shared a huge amount about these spins um, and all of the details. So if you are interested in learning more, cause she did um, a Navajo Chiro lock for her double coated and um, she spun those up, tog, thel, all the different things. When we use uh, the terminology tog and thel, that's for Icelandic specifically. So that's language that is used for Icelandic. Um, and so when we're talking about the inner and outer coats um, for the rest of the breeds, we need to be talking about the inner coat, the outer coat, and then the combination of the inner and outer. Tog and Thel is really only for Icelandic. Like that's sort of the language. So uh, just, just as like a nice to know kind of piece of information. So her Navajo Chiro is there. Um, and I, I, I have mixed feelings about Navajo Chiro when I've spun it in the past. It always has come out ropey and overspun. And it's a breed that I would like to come back to and play with again in the future. Uh, because the one that I had access to was really badly fulled in the dyeing. And uh, it's something that I really want to um, uh, spin again and play with again. So thank you for, uh, for sharing, Allison. And then Linnea has been working on her Charolais for the Downs. These yarns came up beautifully. Um, she had 200 grams of commercially made top of Charolais that she spun to five bobbins on her flat iron. The plan was to make a five ply, a three ply, and a two ply um, just so that she could compare them. So she spun a very fine singles and then she did a five ply um, and then she did a the three ply and then she did the two ply. So out of all of the yarns, um, she found the five ply actually quite frustrating and the three ply was okay, but it still made kind of a ropey yarn. And then the two ply ended up being the easiest and made the, the nicest yarn. So this one I think is her five ply and um, the other two you can see, you can see immediately which one was the two ply that worked out the best. Um, it just kind of worked. And then this little photo here is this, that's uh, some of the singles. So, so that she could kind of compare them all. So really, oh, maybe this is the five ply. Really interesting. I would highly recommend if you're doing 51 yarns to go back and read Linnea's post about these yarns because it was really interesting to read. Um, and she had quite, uh, quite a bit of difficulty putting, putting twist into some of the yarns and um, um, having them come out not feeling really super ropey. So um, and Charolais is very, very short stapled. It's very downy, very sproingy, very squishy. Um, so when you're plying it up, it's going to poof and it's going to, um, um, really come up to life. And so these are yarns that, uh, really have that downy feeling, which a lot of people found in our last breed and color study, which was on Charolais. So uh, lots to think about and take into account. Now, Sherry has been working through her luxury um, along, and these are all of her initial skeins. So these are the wild silks that she's been exploring. So there's Muga at the second one down. So there's Tassa, Muga, Red, Red, Red Eerie, and her peduncle. And she really enjoyed spinning them all. And I have to say, Sherry, your spinning is just beautiful. Like all of these yarns are just beautifully spun. Really, really lovely done. And I like how she laid them out from light to dark. So they almost look like they're in a bit of a gradient. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you find a pin drafter anyway? <laughs> Maybe it'll come up on like Craigslist or Kijiji one day. <laughs> Maybe somebody could invent a small one. So if you guys could get on that uh, and invent a small pin drafter, and then I could put it in my garage and I could beta test it for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> 
might not fit in the garage. Yeah, we probably need a shed out back. I have a 10 by 10 shed, so I could put the pin drafter in there, but nobody, nobody could actually be in there with it. And it probably wouldn't be very safe. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're just being silly. This is from Maria. This is beautiful. I love this sweater so much. Thank you for sharing it, Maria. Um, this was her hand spun sweater. So this is plied. I'm not even going to try to say the name of the yarn of the, sorry, of the, of the sheep of the breed. It's Plyo T. Lopi. Try to say that five times fast. It, I'm not saying it correctly. Um, I will put it in the chat right now. Um, the sweater is another name that I can't um, pronounce, but the pattern is available on Ravelry. So here is the name of the sweater. And um, she went skiing yesterday while wearing this and uh, her beanie is also made of hand spun. Beautiful, Maria. And thank you so much for sharing. And I'm sorry, I can't say the name of these sweaters. The Met San Pioto sweater. I probably just murdered it. Um, it's hard to say some of these, these Scandinavian words, like because of the act, the, um, uh, the, um, not accents, the, um, punctuation on the letters. Like, I don't know what certain punctuation on certain letters means, like how that changes the letter. So it's better for me just to show you the word and you guys can, at least then you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, rather than me trying to pronounce things. One of the other things I find really hard to pronounce is actually uh, pharmacology, like drugs. Um, when we're at work and we, it's, it took me a really long time to get my mouth around some of them, like metoprolol. Um, and most people say met metop metoprolol or they'll say met metolol. Um, it's hard to say these words properly. Um, or like in France, Montpellier, um, getting your word or your mouth around them. And I'd rather say it properly and practice than to murder it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, uh, um, I was talking about propranolol yesterday and most people don't say that, uh, drug properly either. Um, what are some of the other ones that people don't say properly? There's a, there's a lot of them people, and it's hard cause it's hard to get your, your mouth around them. This is from Florence and I'm not sure that I included her in the show notes um, in terms of like what she wrote about this, but this was a spin that she had done recently. Yeah, I didn't update it. So I'm really sorry about that, Florence. I will show throw it in after, but look at that texture on her sweater. Isn't that amazing? Um, so that is all done with stitches. Um, it's not cabled. It's all done with stitches. And then halfway down, um, those, the, the graphic of the stitches is created in the color work. And I just thought this was beautiful and it looks amazing. So thank you so much for sharing Florence. Cause that is just an incredible sweater. Florence is cook goalie, um, on, um, Ravelry and on Slack. Yeah, totally Eve. Yeah. Flu, flu pentox. So, pentatox even I can't say it if I if I sat here and like fix oh yeah and hydrochlorothiazide that's a hard one too yeah carbidolol <laughs> you guys are awesome <laughs> I love that you're throwing out all those words now I used to say metoprolol yeah everybody throws an r in there and that's wrong it's metopro metoprol metoprolol anyways yeah um yeah Megan's actually a, a GP so trans <laughs> Transoxemic acid, that's another one, TXA. Yeah, um, you guys are fantastic. I love that you're now throwing out all these words. Um, Claudia shares hand spun yarn. This I thought this was fantastic. Here is her first real spin. Um, a pin draft to Corydale braid by Small Bird Workshop. So this is from Catherine on the island, um, just uh, a couple of hours um, west of me. Um, the singles were done on my drop spindle and two plied on her Ashford Traveler. It's about a sport weight and she's already got a pattern picked out for it and she's stoked with the results. Uh, yeah, you should be, um, Claudia. It's amazing. And then she has a second skein, which is photographed here as well. Um, the singles were spun on her wheel. Uh, sorry, full skein. Um, first the singles were spun on her wheel. Beautiful sport weight Falkland. She really loves it. It's gorgeous. Um, Claudia, that turned out really, really nicely. I didn't know how to manage the colors and she decided to strip the braid into four sections lengthwise, not super precisely, but she spun two sections per bobbin. Um, and then she par uh, applied it. And I, I think you ended up with a really successful spin here, Claudia, really beautifully done. Gorgeous. I love that. And I like that the colors matched up in some places, Barbara pulled in others. It's just perfect. 
This is Natural Shade Salon and Zero to Hero. This is from, um, her username on Ravelry is at Shrub, so I'm not exactly sure who it is. Um, uh, she shares her uh, natural shades. So this is another yarn for her natural shade sweater. She's using llama fiber again, and she has several shades to work with. So here are two of her samples. Um, she hasn't decided on a pattern, but she's leaning towards uh, Ghost Horses or Trista. I love this gray. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful llama fiber. So um, I'm looking forward to her sharing more and um, um, updating us on how her sampling is going. Uh, this is not in the show notes either, but this one is from, oh, maybe they're not there. Nope, those are from before. So I think that's it for, for all of our shares. I know we had a lot from last week. Um, so thank you, everybody. Oh, Suzanne, it's you. You're Shrub. <laughs> that's me, Shrub. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne, for speaking up. I really appreciate that. Um, it's when people don't put who their name is on Ravelry, sometimes it's really hard to like make connections as to who's who. So, uh, yeah, if you have, um, uh, if you, on your profile page on Ravelry, you don't have to put your last name, just put, um, just put your, uh, um, first name. Oh, that's hilarious. Sus yeah. Bush shrub. That's great. Um, Good luck, Dana. Have a wonderful, um, I hope your second vax goes well. I ended up not having any reaction to my second dose. So fingers crossed for you. Um, <laughs> I'm so tired after an eight hour shift. I have no idea how nurses can pull 12. Thanks, Jill. That means a lot. Um, I know, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how you guys sleep with those wacky shifts. Yeah. You, you know what, to be honest with you guys, you, you really do get used to it. Um, it really is kind of a stamina and an endurance that you just kind of develop over time. Um, the thing is, is that when you work four on, you do have the four off. So I think a lot of us do take, when we're working full time, um, you, you really do kind of savor those four days off. Um, and you do kind of end up having to rush around getting everything done because when you're working, you're, you're basically working and sleeping. That's kind of it. And you kind of get a chance to eat in there somewhere, but it's mostly work and sleep work and sleep. Um, but, um, you guys, but I, but I do think there's sort of a, a certain stamina that you, that you, um, develop. We were talking at work last weekend, actually about, um, a lot of us really, um, we sleep a lot and we value our sleep, um, and we make it a priority. And I think that's something that, um, when you're in that situation where you're working shift work like that, you just have to, you, you have to put sleep above everything else. Um, so I know some parts of the world slash country do, um, straight nights and then they'll do straight days. Um, and there's pros and cons to that. Doing four days is really, really tiring. Doing four nights is really super tiring. Doing a swing where you're doing two days and then two nights is really tiring. So there's not really, um, you're basically dealing with chronic jet lag. Um, oh, Wendy. Yeah, exactly. Jet lag every week. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yes. I had the Pfizer vaccine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. Thank you for being so active in the chat and for um, all of your uh, input and your ideas and your enthusiasm. You guys are just so amazing. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your feedback about the uh, sweater thoughts and the garment fitting issues and also uh, for Sanjo Silk and the box, the deli box. If you guys could please keep the ideas coming, that would be wonderful. And I'll put a call out on um, under the hashtag luxury fibers thread channel on um, both Ravelry and the Slack channel so that you guys can keep uh, putting on uh, uh, giving me um, ideas. There won't be a live stream next week if you missed that at the beginning of the show. And um, I'm sorry about the link this morning that you guys had a little bit of trouble. Again, remember at like five minutes before the show, hit refresh because the links are probably fixed. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for being here. I love these Saturdays. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for saying that. Um, have a wonderful rest of your week. Have a wonderful couple of weeks. For those who have signed up for a Maker Morning, the first one is this coming Thursday. So be um, sure the Zoom link is on the sign up page. So it is already there for you guys to click on. And um, you'll be able to access the uh, the Zoom uh, this coming Thursday. I can't remember. It doesn't start at 1030. I can't remember, but I will see those of you who signed up. If you have not signed up for a maker morning yet between now and the end of March, April, and the end of May, please uh, follow the links on Patreon. If you're a patron of the show, 
and make sure that you claim your spot. Please only sign up for one spot to start with and then we'll see what availability looks like um, as the months go on. So until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting. I will see you guys on Thursday and um, I will see you uh, here on the podcast in a couple of weeks. Bye everyone. Have a wonderful, have a wonderful rest of your day.